What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another mafia topic. And over the years and all my videos, I've discussed the wide array of families that would have mob farm teams set up. A farm team for the mafia was a group of young 20 somethings or teenagers in these mob neighborhoods that would take care of errands, pieces of work, and other things for mob families. One of the lesser known groups involved at one point as a farm team for multiple American mafia families was a group of teens that made up the area of Ridgewood in Queens. One of the most notorious individuals that would ultimately be featured in the FBI's most wanted was this individual. Today, we're going to get in to what New York, would, New York Times would call the group a scourge of Western Queens. The story of one of those members, Paul Ragusa, next on Sit Down Shorts. Paul Ragusa was born Christmas of 1970 in the Italian area of Ridgewood. In Queens, he was born uh, to an individual called Filippo Ragusa, who was from Sicily. Now, Filippo and his wife would have five children. Now, for young Paul, he would be the youngest of five, and all four were girls. So he had all siblings. However, they were girls. So he would grow up pretty spoiled, according to people that knew him in the neighborhood, uh, the baby of a group of women. Now, the Ragusas would live at 6112 Gates Avenue, just a stone's throw away from Fresh Pond Road in Ridgewood. Now, before anyone asks, there is no known relation to Genevieve's higher up, Michael Ragusa. There is no connection to the two. And I just wanted to make that piece of info known. Now, growing up, Paul Ragusa's father actually owned a bakery called Ragusa's in the area. And he was known by many, the father, to be, quote, a good man. He would always take care of his kids. He loved his young son, the first of which he had had. And he would do whatever he could throughout Ragusa's adolescence to make sure he and his friends didn't follow along the road and head down the wrong road. The problem was it really didn't fall far from the tree. Ragusa's father, Filippo, was known as not just a not dime bag heroin dealer. He was a major heroin trafficker and at one point moved a lot of brown through the areas of New York, through the pizza connection in Canada. It was said at one point he had an operation that would operate from Canada into Buffalo and then into New York. And in the 80s, when this operation was uncovered, they would uncover more than 50 pounds of heroin in this piece of work. So Ragusa's father was a big time drug dealer. And this is akin to another individual I discussed in a previous video you can find up here, Anthony Aiello. His father was also a big time heroin dealer. Now, Aiello and Ragusa, the younger, would be a part of a violent crew that we'll get into here in just a second. During the early 80s, Ragusa was just an early teen. He was 10, 12 years old. By this point, though, his older sister, uh, Francesca was very involved in this heroin operation. It was said that Francesca Ragusa was as close to a gangster a female could be. It's that simple. Over the years in history, we don't hear about many women involved in this life. They may be drivers or something like that. But Francesca Ragusa was, quote, very involved in the streets. She knew her street mentality. She sold a lot of drugs and she wanted to be a gangster. It was that simple. Now, by 1983, the federal government would uncover this operation and everyone jammed up would be involved and have to go to prison, including Francesca Ragusa, who would get five years in federal prison. Good for Paul, though. His father would actually go on the lam. It would not be caught until 1989. But as we know, in Ridgewood, a lot of young individuals were connected to the mob. That was Sicilian Zip Bonanno territory, including people like Baldo Amato, Fat Patty Catalano had a social club for the Colombo crime family not far away. It was Bonanno and Colombo territory in that area 
of Ridgewood, Queens. Now, by the mid-80s, Paul Ragusa is into his teens, and he gets a little lucky. Yes, his father and family were involved in a big heroin indictment. However, this would come before the federal forfeiture laws would be enacted, and this would allow a young Ragusa to get a decent windfall uh, from his family's illicit activities. Um, the problem was the money would never last long. According to people that knew Ragusa throughout his young life and into his 20s, he was a known degenerate gambler. He would have money today and the next day he'd be broke. That was the thing for Paul Ragusa. And for him, he would have to set up a life of crime that would pay for his habits and for his life. And it was known pretty quickly. Most of the individuals that grew up in Ridgewood would get into the life. A lot of them were the sons, cousins, family members of known individuals. Now, one of the major people that would be involved early in Paul Ragusa's life was another young individual from Ridgewood, Anthony Tabita. Now, Tabita would be involved in some very heinous crimes that we'll get into here in just a second. It was alleged that he was actually... Uh, kin to Gambino higher up, Lenny Di Maria. So Tabita was known in the streets. He was very involved in Ridgewood. Um, and he and Ragusa would run the streets and they would get involved with a lot of petty stuff, loan sharking, beating folks up, robbery, gambling. They'd get involved with some bookmaking to feed their habits. That's what they did. And eventually the Cafe Giannini crew would come together. That would happen really mid to late 80s. In fact, the building that the Giannini Cafe was in would be run by Baldo Amato, Sicilian Zip that was a higher up by this point. He originally would have a coffee shop not far away. Francesca Ragusa actually owned the building at 6612 Fresh Pond Road. The Cafe Giannini would be housed. She would get in touch with Baldo Amato, and Baldo would indeed rent the cafe off her, and that's where Cafe Giannini was born. It was actually a legitimately run coffee shop. In the back, there would be machines and poker tables and all sorts of stuff, and it was alleged that that's where Ragusa would gamble a lot. He would be very much into the machines and things of that nature. By the late 80s, they would start, though, to get into very uh, heinous crimes and bad crimes. It's important to understand that unlike most of the mob farm teams, the Giannini crew was fairly sparse. In fact, they would work for multiple crews. It was alleged that most of the members would report to different skippers, including uh, Bobby Glasses Vernays, um, Vito Grimaldi, Baldo Amato. They were involved with many different crews and were desperate and would do work for pretty much everybody. Now, uh, for Ragusa, he was alleged as kind of a bit of a, of a loner. He would just do crimes for himself and really didn't come under the flag of really anybody. He would be obviously mentored by people like Baldo Amato, and he would learn the streets very quickly. But Ragusa would set up really on his own as a bit of a revolutionary. Now, other members of the crew, including Vito Guzzo, would report and be under the flag of people like Fat Patty Catalano, um, people like... Uh, Tabita would report to others. Ralph Shuler would report to Bobby Glasses. They would all kind of report to others, but they would all come together and involve themselves in crimes. Paul Ragusa, by the early 90s, would be involved in bank robbery, robbery, uh, gambling, loan sharking, extortion, and even arson. By 1992, though, one of the more infamous crimes would happen that would involve allegedly Paul Ragusa. One of the main people that we hear about from the Cafe Giannini crew was Colombo made man Vito Guzza, who was serving a 40 year prison sentence currently. In 1992, it was alleged that his father, Vito Guzzo Sr., was gunned down by members of the Colombo crime family. He had heard through uh, multiple people that Vincent Vinnie Union's Ricciardo was the man involved in that crime. He would stalk Vinny Unions and two other individuals to a car on Caldwell Avenue in Queens. Guzzo, alongside multiple members of the Giannini crew, including allegedly uh, Joe O'Kane, Anthony Tabita, Giuseppe Sciorra, and Paul Ragusa, stalked the targets. 
Now, allegedly, it has never come out and been under indictment that Paul Ragusa was involved in this crime. However, there are people that have put him at the scene of this crime. I am not saying he was involved directly, but there is a couple of different proof of facts that would connect Paul Ragusa to this crime. Now, in that crime, Ragusa and other members, including Vito Guzzo, would shoot at the car. Now, lucky for Vinny Unions, he would actually survive this hit. The problem was one of the individuals in the car, Anthony Messi, would die in this crime. This would happen in 1992. And this would be something that would come back to haunt uh, members of the Giannini crew. Now, for Paul Ragusa, he would continue running the streets, robbing banks, including the same bank three times. It was alleged in 1993 that he and a group of Giannini members would rob the same National Westminster Bank on Myrtle Avenue in Queens three different times, netting about $200,000. That is a brazen attempt, but when you're desperate and need money and you're willing to do things, you do things over and over again. It's pretty incredible. This group would run the streets and was involved with so many different pieces of work. There were grisly murders that would pop up, including the murder of two marijuana dealers. They would also allegedly kill one of their own uh, after he was uh, uh, skimping on profits and things of that nature. This was a violent crew. At one point, the New York Times would call Cafe Giannini a scourge of Western Queens. Now, for Paul Ragusa, this would not even be close to being the end of his criminal exploits in Queens. The problem was the feds were drawing interest and understanding who this group of guys were. Baldo Mato would eventually be indicted and involved in different murder indictments. But by 1996, the feds were closing in on the Giannini crew. And for Paul Ragusa, he seemed to know it. Uh, according to people that knew him, it was alleged that Ragusa would tell them that he knew the FBI was after him and it would only be a matter of time until he would likely be caught up. In June of 1996, a 32-count indictment would drop down on members of Cafe Giannini. It was a 32-count indictment that would involve charges of murder, arson, loan sharking, extortion, robbery, and other racketeering crimes. Now, by this point, the new leader of the crew was a guy with a very famous last name in Ridgewood. It was the... Uh, nephew of Paul Ragusa, Fabio Bartolotta. Now, Bartolotta is actually the son of Francesca Bartolotta. She would marry into a very known uh, crew, uh, a member of a known crew, and they would have a son, Fabio, who by this point was grown up and involved in the life of crime as well. This is a wild web of family relations. Now, in that indictment, Bartolotta would be jammed up. Uh, Giuseppe Ashura would be jammed up. Vito Guzzo would be jammed up. Now, named in the indictment was Paul Ragusa. Now, the good thing for Ragusa was he realized, hey, I'm going to go on the run and I'm out of here. He would head on the run. That's exactly what he did. He got out of Dodge. It was alleged he didn't go very far. Uh, he would actually be on the run for almost a year. In fact, at one point after the death of an individual in the FBI top 10 most wanted that he would be featured on an FBI most wanted TV show where he would be in the top 10. Paul Ragusa was very much wanted by the FBI and was a notorious criminal in Ridgewood, Queens. The young men of Ridgewood looked up to Paul Ragusa by this point. He was the guy they wanted to be. Uh, and he would be wanted on multiple crimes, including armed robbery, racketeering, arson, and more. The problem, though, for Paul Ragusa was the pressure was too much. He would turn himself in in 1998 in this photo. He had obviously sported the canary yellow hair. I guess he watched a couple of Eminem Slim Shady videos and took on a new hair uh, uh, dye. Um, haircut. So uh, it didn't really matter. He kind of looked the same. So it didn't matter because he turned himself in anyway. Uh, he would be ultimately convicted. Paul Ragusa 
on racketeering, robbery, and more, and get 19 years in federal prison. Most of the individuals in the Giannini crew, and I probably will do a long-standing video on the Giannini crew down the road, uh, would ultimately either go to prison like Vito Guzzo or flip. Now, multiple members would flip, including Anthony Tabita, uh, an individual that we had on this show, Frank Fiordolino, he would flip as well. Uh, some would go to jail, some would flip. Uh, a guy like Joe Kane, he would go to jail and would be killed in prison. So a lot of these guys would either go to prison or flip. I want to discuss one individual that would be involved in this 32 count indictment really quick. This is how truly sickening some of the members of this crew was. One of the suspects in this indictment, John Clemenza, would be involved in a disgusting case where he would hire an individual from the neighborhood called Peter Kafif. He would uh, scheme and tell Kafif to shoot his teenage age girlfriend who refused to have an abortion. The indictment would say that she would be lured to a subway stop where Kafif would shoot her. Ultimately, the woman will lose her baby. These were the kind of things some of the members of this crew were doing. Now, I want to make it clear. Ragusa was not involved in that piece of work, but this was a wide-ranging indictment. This was the kind of guys some of these folks were. Now, for Paul Ragusa, he would head to federal prison, and we wouldn't hear from him for a long period of time. However, in 2017, he would be re released to a halfway house in New York City. And as we know, with criminals, once a criminal, always a criminal. For Paul Ragusa, he would have to kid back to the streets and find new ways to make money. In July of 2017, he would come into contact with an old friend, an individual he would meet in the streets of Queens, Vincenzo Enzo Moreña. By this point, Moreña was a made member of the Bonanno crime family. The problem for Paul Ragusa was, since 2014, Moreña was an FBI informant. And the job for Morania was to head into the streets and get known members of organized crime jammed up. In July of 2017, he would approach Ragusa, who was desperate to make money. They would get into a conversation about money where Ragusa would say, quote, could I make good money on a murder for hire plot? Taped and wired up, Enzo Moreno would respond, quote, you could get a couple hundred thousand from someone I know. Ragusa would respond with, quote, I hope he comes around tomorrow. So Ragusa was very much willing to commit murder. In fact, in that same conversation, he would say that he did not need a gun because, quote, he would stick a fucking ice pick through someone's head if he needed to. Not only would he discuss murder for hire, but Paul Ragusa would also say, when asked if he could transport guns, if he knew anybody, quote, yes, I can do it. I'll do it. At that point, Morania would set it up and Ragusa would be uh, instructed to go to a warehouse in Nassau, Queens, where an individual would meet him and give him nine weapons. The problem for Ragusa was that individual that would meet him was an FBI agent. In the case, it was alleged that he would get nine guns, including two AK-47 assault rifles, and one M-16. He would transport the weapons to an unknown location where he would receive $2,000. The problem for Paul Ragusa was everyone was involved in the FBI. In 2018, Paul Ragusa, who, by the way, was on federal parole in a halfway house, was given 72 months in federal prison. According to the federal prison BOP website, on May 5th, 2022, Paul Ragusa was again released to a halfway house in New York City. He is 52 years old. Paul Ragusa has not learned. When you go to a halfway house, you need to be on your best behavior. We'll see if this time Ragusa can stay on his best behavior. But at 52 years old, he's pretty young. And as we know from multiple members of this crew, that have not learned, including Aiello and Vito Guzzo, it's likely he may head back to the haunt he knows best. For him, let's hope Paul Ragusa stays out and just gets a straight job. As always, thank you for watching. 
Make sure if you enjoy this video, hit the like button and subscribe so you never miss another video.